What I want to do is talk about uh, wrapping up the multi-stage refrigeration that we talked last time. Talk a little bit about practical aspects, selecting refrigerants, uh, the push to have chlorine-free refrigerants, the phasing out of older refrigerants uh, because of environmental concerns, um, ear, sear, and energy guide, and then talk about absorption. The YouTube videos that I point you to uh, for cascade, heat pump, and gas refrigeration, I don't think I'm going to be able to cover it today, so catch that on the online lecture YouTube videos. This is a problem we were solving. And one thing I didn't do, if you have your notes, you can refer back to this problem, but I didn't put it on a real temperature entropy diagram, and I think there's some value to that. So I know it was a little awkward starting putting state three on this diagram, but if you recall, state three was that high pressure coming out of the condenser saturated liquid. And that high pressure was 900 in 11.5 kilopascal. So it's coming out right here at a temperature of around 36 degrees C, saturated liquid. That was our state number three. And then on a temperature entropy diagram, now the entropy scale is different than the table of properties that I show here for S because I'm calling a different uh, set of software routines. And so what it is is they've shifted the datum point for entropy. And we could go and investigate, well, what's the datum point for entropy for this set of software built into Excel that I used and this one, which is RefProp, pushed out by NIST. Sometimes they're very consistent, sometimes it's shifted. Okay, so this time it's shifted, but what you do is you go to state four State four, you're going to have an increase in entropy, and you're going to go down to an intermediate pressure. And then state five went down to a even lower pressure of 100 kilopascal. Then if we look at the diagram, state six is saturated vapor. At that low pressure, state seven was saturated vapor at that intermediate pressure. Eight went through an expansion valve, which was not isentropic, so there was some entropy generation, but it went down to this low pressure. State eight was at this low pressure, and we found that the temperature at state eight was around negative nine. So this is like negative five, negative 10, so it's around negative nine, where uh, this other is at negative 26, and uh, the intermediate pressure was at negative four. So state eight is right around there. Then you combine state one and state six to make state one at low pressure. And it came in at um, that temperature was um, uh, negative 16. So it's around right here, negative 16. You could try and draw it more to scale. Then you put it through the compressor from state one to state two, and it has to go all the way up to this high pressure, and we'll do it reversibly. And when you do that, you find that the temperature comes out at around 55 degrees C. And that's state two. Cool to get it to be saturated, then condense in the condenser. We did that graphically, but here it's put to scale on a temperature entropy diagram. How about this plot for pressure enthalpy? Should I spend a minute or two on this or skip it? Go ahead and show it. So start with state three for this problem, which was saturated liquid at that 911 kilopascal, but here it's 36 degrees C, so that's easy to show. That's state three. Constant enthalpy, but go ahead and do a dashed line indicating that it's irreversible down to four. Four had a pressure of uh, 256, 250 kilopascal, and negative four degrees C 
evaporator temperature and then drop it down to 5, which had an evaporator temperature of negative 26 and around just slightly over 100 kilopascal. Then we had state 6, saturated vapor at that low pressure, state 7, saturated vapor at that low intermediate pressure, 250, so it's at negative 4. Then we have to slow down a little bit. We have isenthalpic expansion from 7 to 8. All right, well, this is a pressure enthalpy pH diagram. So state uh, 8 is straight down, dashed line, until you get to the same pressure. So right there is state 8. Um, it's going to be tight. There's state 8. Now, state 8 came in at this negative 9.2 degrees C, so I put an additional isotherm on there, and it's right there is state 8, as best as I could plot it with this software. It's at negative 9 at that low pressure, straight down below state 7 on a pH diagram. And then when you combine them together, 1 and 8, it, it's in between, uh, there's state 1. So it's at a temperature of, let's say, negative 16 at that low pressure. Remember that this line is negative 26. This line is negative 9. And so negative 16, I didn't plot it, but it would be something like that. And it would go through 1. And it's... Look, what is the description of state one? Subcooled liquid, two phase, or superheated vapor? Slightly superheated vapor, that's right. Not very far from being saturated vapor. And then we put it through. This one's a harder one because what we have to do is we have to boost it up to this high pressure. And it's going to end up at a temperature of 55. So that's where state two is. It's, it's a line here of 55 degrees C. And so 1 to 2 goes like that. It's a line of constant entropy. S is constant through that compressor. And then you compress, not compress, condense or cool it at constant pressure and then condense it. There's the loop. There's the process. Hopefully all that makes sense. Yes, sir. Uh, from 3 to 4, yeah, the S is going up because of irreversibilities through this expansion valve from 3 to 4. This is irreversible, as well as this is irreversible and that's irreversible. And also that mixing, if you said, where are the four sources of irreversibilities in this system? Well, it's going to be here, 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 here. Those are all internal. There's other source of ex irreversibilities, but it's external. And it's this initial cooling of that superheated vapor in that condenser. But most people would classify that as an external irreversibility due to the temperature difference between the sink, the temperature source sink, and the temperature of the fluid. Anytime you have a heat transfer through a delta T. Okay. Yeah, uh, because it is very irreversible. Uh, you take a hot fluid and a cold fluid, and you put them together, you come out with a warm fluid. Try and turn that around. Take a warm fluid and say to yourself, I'm a clever engineer. I'd like to take a stream of warm fluid and separate it to a stream of hot fluid and cold fluid. Conservation of energy says, no problem, you can do it. But practice in your mind says, I like, it's not going to be easy. And that's the second law. It's basically saying it's irreversible. So that's another reason why when I asked how am I going to determine state one, I know that I, I gave an opportunity to do a mass balance, an en energy balance, or an entropy balance. Okay, And uh, this one, you don't know the amount of irreversibility generated because of the mixing of a cold and warm fluid stream. So that's not going to help you. 
Uh, this one is the one that allows us to fix state one, doing an energy balance where this mixing occurs. Two pipes, two tubes, two whatever connecting and one going out. And the mass balance was trivial. We had used that already. That help? Any other comments? So there it is on a real pressure enthalpy diagram drawn to scale. Let's just talk a little bit about selecting refrigerants. Uh, when you select a refrigerant, it makes sense, but you need to consider the performance of the system. If you change refrigerants, you can change uh, the pressures that it has to jump between and tube, the condenser and evaporator pressure. It can change uh, how much heat of vaporization the fluid has. It, it could change the, the properties of the substance, hence the performance. Also, unfortunately, refrigerants leak and uh, they get into the environment. And when they're in an environment, they can have an environmental impact, not directly kill somebody, or they can injure or kill somebody, and that can be a safety concern. So environmental concerns and safety concerns are uh, very important. A uh, long time ago, they generated some synthetic refrigerants. And if you watch the videos that I encourage you to watch, I went back and I looked at early in the history of refrigerants, there were some refrigerants which were very deadly. And unfortunately, they did leak out, and there were a number of deaths due to people putting refrigeration systems or air conditioning systems in homes or apartments or buildings, and then you'd find people dead. And uh, I didn't cover that now, but it's in the videos that I recorded. So uh, um, in the 1930s, they really wanted to improve the safety, and so they developed some synthetic refrigerants, which were excellent because of the low toxicity, low flammability. They're not going to explode or burn. Ammonia can explode. It can, you know, burn. It is an as asphyxiant, and some other refrigerants were even more uh, toxic. And so this set of refrigerants came out, and they did very, very well. But then people started paying more attention to the environmental impact. So a number of years ago, they said we have to not just uh, be concerned about safety and performance, we have to be concerned about the environmental impact. So uh, some of the most prevalent and safest and great performing refrigerants were R12 and R22, but they're on the goodbye list, and R12 has really been gone for a while, and R22 is the same way. So these synthetic refrigerants were um, the, the chlorofluorocarbons or the hydrochlorofluorocarbons. So they had these uh, C's in there that, would, that are the problem, the, the C for the chlorine. So some of these refrigerants had chlorine in them, and then unfortunately when they get out and they go somewhere in the environment, a lot of them would go very high in the altitude. They'd get up into the ozone layer, sunlight would interact with them, they'd bust out that chlorine, that chlorine would then interact with the O3, the ozone, and then before you know it, they had gaping holes in the ozone, which played a very important role in the Earth's atmosphere because a lot of the UV high energy, high intensity light participates in the ozone at the high altitudes, and then if you have holes in it, that light's coming down uh, and hitting people and hitting whatever, the earth. And so to, uh, they, they linked the holes in the ozone to the chlorine in the refrigerants, which are naturally going to escape out of the system. You, you try not to release stuff into the environment, but that's unfortunately what happens. If you have a refrigeration system, air conditioning in the front of the car, and you have a wreck with a car, you've seen what happens. It's all gone. It's all leaked out, just like other things leak out. So as far back as 87, international agreement banned the production of these chlorine-containing refrigerants. R12 was the first, and they started developing a chlorine-free class of refrigerants, hydrofluorocarbons. An example is R134A. And now 22 is being phased out, or has been phased out, and it's generally being replaced by 410A. It's kind of like the market figures out what is the best refrigerant 
cheapest to produce, great thermal performance, great uh, uh, safety. And so here's just an illustration. Let's see if we could see this one. How many uh, fluorines does it have? Two. Okay, looking at the color scheme, do you think the fluorines are the yellow, the black, the white, or the green? The green. Look at this one. We have a fluorine, fluorine, and a fluorine. So it's got four. One, two, three. So let's, there's the four greens, the four fluorines. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the carbon. Here's a carbon. Here's a carbon and a carbon. Can you guess which one is, is the black one or, or the big? Which one is the carbon? The black one in the middle. Okay, that, that's like a methane looking type of molecule. Carbon's in the middle and then it's reaching out. Now this one has the chlorine attached. It's the R22. This one has no chlorine. There's no big chlorine molecule. And then you have a hydrogen, that's the H right there. And then over here you have two H's, an H and an H. So anyway, there's your chemistry review. <laughs> but out goes the chlorine from these. So we have a, phased, a phase out of these chlorine containing, going back to that Montreal Protocol in 87. But I just throw this out in 2010, January of 2010, they may not produce any new air conditioners and heat pumps containing R22. And so that stopped five years ago. And then what about this one? January of this year. Hey, that's pretty recent, isn't it? And so January of this year, it requires the U.S. to reduce its consumption of hydrochlorofluorocarbons by 90% below the U.S. baseline. I don't remember the baseline, but there's continuing um, uh, benchmarks and uh, requirements or agreements. But this was a big one right here, big, 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 as well as saying goodbye to R12. Um, that R22, is, uh, because it's being phased out, not produced, it's become very valuable. So if you can reclaim it and then uh, clean it, there's companies in Houston and other places that do that, then it's, it's very valuable per pound. You can sell it. Uh, UTSA just recently got rid of its last batch of R22, and I talked to the guy, and I may have mentioned it. They sold it for a pretty, pretty penny. <laughs> they got a lot of money for the poundage of R22 that was still in the central plant, but they don't have any more on campus. Now, uh, not only does it gobble up the ozone, so that's some sort of ozone depleting potential. They measure, okay, this one is not so bad, this one's really bad. But uh, you have also uh, global warming potential. And so that's another environmental impact, and you're seeing more of that, but not necessarily in refrigeration. You're seeing it in power production with emissions from coal plants, true? So the global warming potential. But they would look at a lot of the the refrigerants and look at the bad actors. Let's say this R12 was not so good from an environmental point of view for ozone as well as global warming. So it's gone. And then you see some other refrigerants coming. 22 was really not bad for ozone depleting, but it's gone as well. Um, 134A is that in this list right here. So it's really good for no chlorine, no ozone depleting, but it does have some global warming potential. You don't want to just release the refrigerant willy-nilly into the atmosphere. You're not supposed to. Technicians can get in trouble for doing that. It's against the law. And there are some other refrigerants, but some refrigerants are natural refrigerants and uh, be good, be better. Okay. Let's talk about energy efficiency ratio, EER, E-E-R, energy efficiency ratio. You can go to the EPA, I think runs this website, energy.gov, and you can look at, oh, they talk about the energy efficiency of room or window air conditioners. I may call it a window air conditioner or a room air conditioner. It's something typically set in a wall 
and if you have a window, usually you put it in a window, but some people cut a hole in the wall just for that unit. And it air conditions just that zone or just that room and it's all packaged together. I think you have experience with it. But it measures the energy efficiency, it's a metric, and this metric is, is the cooling capacity in particular units of BTU per hour. BTU per hour to the to dividing by the power input in watts, the electric power required to drive the machine. So the higher the ear rating, it's better for performance. You're going to get more cooling per electric power consumption. Now they talk about many room air conditioners have an ear in the range of 8 to maybe 10 or slightly greater. And so this energy star that you know you've seen different appliances a stove a hot water heater you go and try to buy an appliance and they'll have these ratings and i'll show you some ratings and energy star qualified or equipment um, they require a higher energy rating so this ear is energy efficiency ratio when you're running an air conditioning system wouldn't it depend on how hot the outside is and how humid the outside is sure so they basically specify this is your standard outside temperature and outside humidity. And then you try to run it with a standard 50% inside and 75 degree F inside temperature. So this is your inside temperature and relative humidity as well. So this looks a lot like our coefficient of performance, doesn't it? What was our definition of coefficient of performance for a refrigeration system? It was how much work to cool. So I like a large amount of cooling for the amount of work provided. And here they're just saying, oh, it's a rate of cooling and a rate of energy provided. And we have to plug it in and we consume electricity. So take it all the way back to the electricity, not just the shaft to run the compressor. So to jump back and forth between these two, you have to um, deal with energy conversion factors. So here are the two energy conversion factors that they're on your equation sheet, but you need to know how you go back and forth between a watt and a BTU per hour. So one watt, 3.412. B2 per hour. So sometimes you'll see this factor 3.412 floating around. Well, that's, that's what they're doing is converting between watts and B2 per hour. Or you'll see this inverse of that, which is 0 .9, 0 0.293. We'll solve a problem, but let's uh, take a look at this energy guide, this yellow sticker. Have you ever seen these on appliances? They're all over. Take a small look. It's a U.S. government, you know, trying to standardize and help consumers make good choices about purchasing stuff, comparing costs, efficiencies. Um, I always love this. Uh, law prohibits, federal law prohibits removal of this label. Uh, but then they finally said before the consumer purchase. So once you purchase, you can remove the label. Isn't that nice? Do you remember ever growing up and they had the little mattress tag? <laughs> And I was always afraid I was going to rip that tag off. They're going to come arrest me. Seriously. You did too? And, and it's like, man, I didn't know it was such a bad thing to do to rip the tag off the mattress. Uh, I wonder how many children still remember that. But anyway, I like that they added, you know, once you buy it, guess what? Rip the tag off if you want. You can do that. You're now the owner. All right. Uh, they have a little block and they have a description. This is for a room air conditioner with reversed cycle and with louvered sides. So a little description of it. And then they typically come in with the company and the model number and the capacity of the you know, model number. And then they have a scale and they say, oh, for similar models. I don't know how they come up with it. I mean, the, some committee sits there and, and they say, we've seen some down that are low and some that are going to really be energy hogs. This one looks like it's going to be right in here to help you see visually what you're buying compared to others. And if you buy it, you might anticipate an annual energy cost to run this device 
as the average person would run it in the average state and the average city. I don't know how they come up with it all, right? But it's $98. And then this is the ear to 9.5. So the ear is 9.5. Now, do they put any units right here? Nope. Guess what? You got to know the units. <laughs> you have to remember the units. What was it? It was BTU per hour per watt. That's exactly right. So they won't put those units. They just report the number. They don't want to confuse the consumer with all these convoluted units. So, um, and then your costs will depend on your utility rates and how you use it. Yep, yep, yep. Blah, blah, blah. And so they did it on a 2007 national average electricity cost of about 11 cents per kilowatt hour, blah, 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 blah. Okay. If the air conditioner, the room air conditioner that you buy, has an ear of 9.5, what is its COP? We learned COP in this class. We go out in the real world, hey, they're talking ear. How can I go back and forth? Is the COP for this system 9.5? Uh, is the COP for this system less than 9.5? Is the COP for this system greater than 9.5? Answer A, B, or C will take a wild guess. How's that? Just to warm up your creative juices. So, is the coefficient of performance going to be greater, equal, whatever? This is equal, this is less, and this is greater than 9.5 for this problem. Everybody take their wild guess. All right. I'm not going to give you enough time. Let's go ahead and stop it and show it. Show the results. All right. And we're all over, but that's okay. So let's put this to the side, and then let's calculate it. So how would I convert it? Well, I'd start with something that's true. I'd say the EER is 9.5. I'm repeating the information given to me in the problem. But they left out the units on that. So I add in what I know about the EER. This is units of BTU per hour per watt. Okay? So if I just wrote this by itself, as an engineer, I'm saying, wrong. The units got to be in there. Now, somebody says, don't those units cancel? Well, it's power over power, but they don't cancel. I, I, it's one of these things where maybe you just need to really struggle with it. I, I tried to make up an example, but I don't know if it'd fall flat. Let's say we, 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 this is my example I tried to think of before coming into class. Let's say I have a metric for the strength metric. Here is my strength metric, SB. And it's defined as the ratio of how much I can bench press divided by my weight. True? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds like a good metric. Hey, I weigh 200 pounds and I can bench press 100. My SB metric is a half, right? Somebody says, I weigh 100 pounds and I can bench 100 pounds. Your, your SB metric is one. You see it like that? But that would be pounds over pounds. Somebody says, nah. Yeah, I know I bench in pounds, but my weight in newtons. <laughs> Don't ask me. It's a bad example. Nobody's weights in newtons, but maybe they say their weights in kilos. I don't know, but some other unit. Then you would say and you would compute it, and it wouldn't be a half or one. It would be some other number. So the units matter. That's my poor example. If it, didn't, if it fell flat, sorry. But I have to start. Now this equation is correct. Now I can multiply this equation by 1, and I can play with this equation all the day long. True? 
So what's, uh, what, what, what do I want to do to it if I take this equation and I say, hmm, did I cover it up down here? Let me do this. Grab this. I'm going to use one of these, aren't I? Okay. Should I just declare the winner and then call it quits? Okay, then I get this box out of the way. The coefficient of performance is typically less than, less than, so it's, it's, it's less than uh, 9.5. Hey, we had 55% correct. That's not bad. That's not bad for guessing. Okay. So what we do is we have that this uh, ear of 9.5, let me get over here, and I want to use that if I take the ear and I multiply by 1, then it, it converts it over. So if I multiply it by a 1 of 1 watt per 3.412 BTUs per hour, I just multiply by 1, then I'll get an ear in different units, but this ear in different units is also the same as the COP of the refrigeration that we studied. Okay? Because the COP that we study, when we do the ratio, we want it in kilowatts per kilowatt, or watt per watt, or kilojoule per kilogram, per kilojoule per kilogram. That COP is truly dimensionless that we studied, but the ear wasn't. Okay. So uh, this ear coming in at uh, 9.5, you divide it by 3.412, and you find a COP of about 2.8, 2.78 for the refrigeration. Unit conversion. OK? All right. Now. When you have a central air conditioner, not a room air conditioner, when it's called a split system, hey, that's the typical split system in a lot of apartments and houses and that, and it's central air conditioner, they don't do an ear, they do a sear. Have you ever heard of sear? What's the S for? Seasonal. But the rest of it's the same, energy efficiency ratio. So what they did was they said, well, we don't have just one fixed outdoor temperature. It varies over the year. We want our system to vary over the year. And so it's like car. You have miles per gallon, city driving, highway driving. They're trying to get it to be more representative of the type of environment it may be in over the year. So it's a seasonal energy efficiency ratio. Uh, same type of, you know, federal government tag, federal law, don't remove till you buy it. This is where you put the company and model number information. Here's a scale from not so good to the best out there. The visually show where if you buy this model, oh, it's down in the 13.3 range. It's of the SEER. It's lower end, not high end. You could buy a model up in the 20-some percent, or not 20%, 23 as a maximum range for this type of thing. And so that's what this SEER is. And these are just uh, based on split system only and how they combine and did the calculations. Well, <clears throat> what they've been doing over the number of years is they first came out with SEER and then finally manufacturers would report their SEER for the equipment. They didn't use to before, a long time ago. They would just say it's a two ton, five ton, or 10 ton, one unit. They didn't even have it. They didn't repeat, report it. It wasn't, it's the customer just said, will it cool me? All right. And how much does it cost? Not how efficient is it? But then they started putting these on there, and then they wouldn't be able to sell. I remember my dad got one. Hey, I got one 10 seer. I paid a little extra money. I got a more efficient unit. 10 seer now is like no, no, right? But I do remember when he paid. Do anybody remember? You're too young. <laughs> Pay a little more. Got a 10 SEER unit. This is great. It'll save me a lot of money. Okay. So as of January 06, that's been a long time ago, 
All residential split air conditioning systems sold in the U.S. have a minimum of uh, 13 SEER. It's well beyond the 10 SEER. And to be Energy Star qualified, you would needed a 14 SEER. Now, not to stop there, those that are manufactured after 2005 have to have a minimum. You can't even make them. And the window units need a 10 SEER. Now, look at this. Starting January 1st, 2015. Hey, that's not too long ago. All right, that's just a couple weeks ago. Split system central air conditioners installed in the southeast region of the United States. Southeast region. Okay, here's the definition of the southeast region. Alabama, Arkansas, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Kentucky. Hawaii is in southeast. <laughs> All right, Louisiana, Maryland, <laughs> Mississippi, <laughs> North Carolina, and guess what? We are in the southeast region of the United States. This is where people spend a lot of time in their homes in the middle of summer and the air conditioner is running. This, is Minnesota up there in this list? No. North Dakota? No. You can even live in a house that doesn't have central air conditioning in Minnesota. But you cannot live in a house in Minnesota without <coughs> a central heater. Unless it's fire. Okay, I mean, you got a, a wood burner. But basically, it's very... Yeah, you'd freeze. Is there a reason why they made this heater and air numbers in this place? Uh, historically, it's like uh, some number to make it look appealing, like a number that's down like 0.1 and 0.01. That doesn't appeal to the consumer. Something that's over 100, like a 500, 1,000, that doesn't appeal. So they kind of get it into a range where I could talk about a 13 or a 15 sear, but that's about it. It's marketing. Some engineers said, look, it'll be easier for people to compare. And so, but uh, now, guess what? You can't even buy a 13 seer. It's got to be a 14 or better. So, split systems installed in all other states outside. So up in Minnesota, if you really have the money, you want to put it in, yeah, you can put it in a 13 seer, no problem. So things change. Things continue to change. Last year, the electric bill needed to run an air conditioning system was $3,000 with a 13 sear system. The system needs to be replaced. If it's replaced with an 18 sear system, estimate the electric bill for next year. Hmm. So let's just sort of tabulate and break this problem down. Last year and next year. The future and the past. The past and the future, okay? So last year, we paid uh, $3,000 for the electric bill. I probably want some symbol introduced to, to help you know, show that. I'll probably say C-E-L-E-C, -E -E cost of electricity. You know, if I uh, knew, this is really what I'm asked to find. If, if I replace it, estimate the electric bill for next year. Right? That's what I'm looking to find, the cost of electricity next year. Well, I got a little confusion because I, I have the same symbol. Maybe I add a little. If I run it for a year with a 13 sear, that's how much it costs, 3000 bucks. If I run it with an 18 sear, so I got a little added subscript to it, it's going to cost different. Is it going to cost less? Oh, clicker question. Great clicker question right here. So, haha. <laughs> So the cost, electric 18, is it going to be less than the cost electric if I run 13, the same, or greater than, answer A, B, or C? Do you understand that question? If I replace the 13 that needs to be replaced with an 18, will my electric bill next year be... The same? Will it be less or greater? Everybody in? This is just a see if you're awake question, right? Are we going to be all there? So let me just kind of put this in context. $3,000, right? Next year, ah, maybe... $5,000, good choice to put in an 18 sear. No, that would be ridiculous. 
All right, I'm ready to tabulate. I hate to say it, but not everybody's correct. All right, let's put it out there. I don't know why 18% think that the higher efficiency unit's going to cost more to run. But it's going to cost less to run, isn't it? Pardon? Okay, now that's a practical aspect that we're not going to consider, but what do you do when you get a brand new car? Drive it. And if you don't drive your car, it don't burn any fuel. So if you buy a car to improve your miles per gallon so you save money, but then you drive it more, you didn't save money. The same thing is true. People that install air conditioning systems in homes, they will never promise you a reduction in your next month electric bill because they know what you're going to do. You're going to say, ooh la la. I was complaining because it couldn't even get down to 78. Now I can crank this baby to 68 and sleep with a parka on. <laughs> down to 68 it goes and your electric bill is higher. But you're comfortable. So just like your car, you know. You, you get out there and you use it a lot. Okay, so we're, hopefully this is a lot less. Now, let's continue on. Uh, we had a seer of uh, 13. I know that's kind of funny notation, but a seer of 18. But I have two numbers of seer. I'm going to take a ratio of these different seers in a minute, so I'm going to have a subscript <laughs> to say this is the seer from last year, this is the seer from next year. All right, and then you have the cost of the electricity, and typically it's around 10 cents per kilowatt hour. If you live in Houston, it's a little more. You live in Hawaii, it's a lot more. If you live in some other place like Washington State where they get a lot of hydropower, it's a lot less. Live in Texas, it's below the national average, and San Antonio is below the average of Texas, so it's real cheap. So the cost per electricity, this is another thing. Next year, does it go to 12 cents a kilowatt hour? Uh, then I can't compare apples and apples. I mean, I, I've got to make an assumption that, one, I'm going to run the system to provide the same amount of cooling within the house as I did last year. I'm not going to increase the running of the machine. Second, I'm not going to pay more or less for electricity. So those are two big assumptions. So the cooling for when I had it last year is the same as the cooling when I have it next year. I don't know how much it is, I just know it's the same. I just know they're the same. The, the cooling, the amount of cooling. And I know, I just put some numbers there as a, a national average, but I should have left those as unknown and they're the same. So this analysis works the same in Hawaii, where they pay a lot more per kilowatt hour of electricity, or Texas, where it's a lot cheaper. So what I want to do is I want to start relating these, and I say, huh, the energy, the amount of electricity that I have to buy that really drives my bill, right? The amount of electricity I need to buy is related to how much cooling I want in my home and the SEER number. This SEER, I can spell SEER, come on now. True? Is that statement true? Remember the definition of SEER? I know it had funny units, but think of this as cooling is in BTUs over the year of heat removed, and then you have that kilowatt hour of, of electric use or electric uh, consumption. So I can write it over here that this is electric for the 13. This is the electric use for the 18. It's the amount of cooling divided by the sear of the 18. This is the sear of the 13. What I do is I take these equations and I replace the Q cool right here. I replace it with the results from this equation such that I write that the amount of electricity needed to run the 18 sear next year is equal to the amount of electricity needed to run the 13 sear last year times the sear last year divided by the sear this year. See the algebra? Now it's pretty easy. <laughs> 
So what I do is I put in and I find that uh, point uh, 72. So my, uh, when I do a ratio of 13 divided by 18, oops, 13 divided by 18, that's 0.72. My electric consumption is going to be 72% of it, what it was last year, meaning there's a savings, a reduction of 28%. 28% savings or reduction, however you want to describe it in electric consumption, and the cost of electricity didn't set, change, and so the cost went down. So the final cost for the 18 seer next year is 72 of the cost for the 13 seer, so it's going to be right at $2,167, representing a savings of $833, I'm running out of room, $833 savings, all right? Well, this is covered on the online video with the cascade, as well as ammonia absorption refrigeration, okay? So watch the videos. Thank you for your attention.